it's true I may be the grandmother or <laughs> whatever of, of this field, but I never wanted it to be called porn studies. I wanted it to be called pornography studies. Um, and now there's a journal called Porn Studies, and the first, uh, the, the first issue of that journal has an essay by me saying why it should be called Pornography Studies, not, because I think it's more serious and not signaling a kind of love of the genre, which, um, I mean, yes, we have all become more familiar with it, but I do think we need to be somewhat scholarly in thinking about uh, pornography. So I like to call it pornography studies. But uh, what I have done here in my talk, let me see. Uh, I just need to have it closer. Is gone back to the very beginning of what made pornography happen in the hardcore sense in which I have uh, written about it. Uh, and so my title is Motion and Emotion, a Feminist Perspective on the Frenzy of the Visible. Okay, I think I have the hang of it. Um, movies move, and as sensory perceptions, they can also move those who see them. Indeed, the very word emotion, which is from the Latin emovere, or agitate, derives from motion. Surprise, rapture, fear, anger, lust. These are some of the emotions that William James once characterized as standard. Lust, oh, by the way, if anyone, uh, there's an empty seat right there in the front. If those of you, if, if everyone is comfortable, that's fine. But if you're uncomfortable, there's one more seat. William James once characterized these emotions as standard. Lust, however, has often been treated as the outlier, not quite fitted to a discussion of Kantian aesthetics. Yet nowhere is this relation of motion to emotion so evident as in hardcore visual pornography. Most scholars consider this pornography to have been born either with photography or with the movies themselves. It is as if the realistic motion of moving images quite naturally produced as a byproduct of the realistic, as a byproduct, the realistic depiction of lust. I find this progression, which I once assumed to be a little too simple. When I first wrote Hardcore, I took for granted that it was the realism of movement itself made possible by the invention of movies that had brought about the development of a genre of moving image pornography. With the subtitle, with the subtitle, Power, Pleasure, and the Frenzy of the Visible, I meant to allude to the arrival of lust at the movies. I borrowed this term from French film theorist Jean-Louis Comolli who wrote in 1980 that the second half of the 19th century lives in a sort of frenzy of the visible. Today I'd like to reconsider what I meant when I appropriated that term by considering the later work of another scholar, um, Jonathan Crary. Cinematic apparatus theorists and here I'm going back to the 70s of film study, cinematic apparatus theorists believed that realist cinema perpetuated classical forms of vision, such as classical perspective and the devices such as the camera obscura, which were used to produce realistic effects. Camoli was actually going against that theory when he introduced the term frenzy of the visible that so attracted me. Jonathan Crary, a more recent theorist, <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, argues, I think more fruitfully in his book, Techniques of the Observer, 
that the centered monocular model of vision that was invented by the Renaissance and relied upon principles of the camera obscura had died long before the invention of photography. His innovation is to argue against the truism repeated in nearly every history of photography that photography and film are simply modern refinements of its principle. Query argues instead that as early as 1810, Goethe had recognized that what viewers actually see is not so much the world out there, but the physiology and temporality of their own bodies. Goethe demonstrated what we all, in a sense, know, which is that when we stare at a circle of light and then go into a dark room, a camera obscura, we see a changing series of colors floating upon our retinas. Similarly, what we see when we look at a simple thaumatrope, thaumatrope, now here we have a little glitch in our technology. When we move to moving images, we have to call upon another list to... No uh, information, a second unit of information, oh, oh, and we don't all of which are fused to... Sorry, I don't want that sound. I want my voice to be heard. <clears throat> okay, let's start that again. <clears throat> so this is a simple toy called a thaumatrope. And what we see, of course, is a bird in a cage. But there is no bird in a cage. There's only the illusion caused by the uh, superimposition, in a sense, of the bird and the cage in our eyes. Similarly, the zoetrope, another such uh, toy invention, um, when we see the man walking, he isn't really walking. It's just the effect of of uh, different images superimposing over the other. What produces these subjective impressions? Thank you. Um, not, Crary argues, the principle of vision as understood by the workings of the camera obscura. That model of vision corresponded to the centered <clears throat> monocular vision that the apparatus film theorists believe still reigned after the invention of cinema in the 20th century. <clears throat> the optical principle that light passing through a small hole into a dark chamber, chamber will produce an inverted image of whatever is in front of it on the wall opposite the hole, whether still or moving, reigned, Crary argues, only from the late 1500s to the end of the 1700s. This was a model of vision based upon a centered, isolated human subjectivity enclosed within its dark confines in a purified and superior relation to an exterior world. Almost by definition, then, the observers within the camera obscura are themselves removed from the world they observed. So here, Crary calls this a metaphysics of interiority. One places oneself inside the dark room, figuratively at least, and reproduces what is exterior through the device of, uh, in this case, a certain kind of perspective. This quality of withdrawal from the world in order to better see it this reduction of seeing to an idealized geometric and singular point of view had the effect of decorporalizing the act of viewing. Thus, the camera obscura model of vision, whose quality of quiet contemplation Query finds most perfectly imagined in some of the paintings of Vermeer, constructs a disembodied subject at work in scientific <clears throat> or contemplative observation, as well as in introspective reflection. So while the dominance of the camera obscura paradigm implies a privilege given to vision, it is vision in the service of a non-sensory faculty of understanding that alone seems to give a true conception of the world. This model of vision is the very opposite of a frenzy of the visible.
that arise when new discourses of vision, such as Goethe's, replace it. Query argues that the camera obscura model collapsed in the 1820s and 1830s as a more physiological and embodied understanding uh, of both artistic exploitation and conceptually a vision took its place. In Goethe's color theory and many later understandings of light that made obsolete the notion of a rectilinear propagation of light rays on which classical optics and the science of perspective was based, instead of geometric optics whose calculations produced the illusions of perspective and depth, the camera obscura model of vision gave way to a physiological optics. Sensations belonging to the bodies of observers render irrelevant previous distinctions between interior and exterior. Unlike Vermeer's geographer in contemplative removal from what he observes out there, the human subject becomes both the site and often the producer of sensations. Vision is even redefined as a capacity for being affected by sensations that have no necessary link to a referent. Thus, monocular perspective and geometric optics give way to a new model of vision and to new visual media that take into account irrational agitations of the body and the capacity to move in both the image viewed and the bodies of viewers. This is what I want to call the frenzy of the visible model of vision. <clears throat> a model that countenances a new genre of pornography aimed at inciting lust. So vision is now redefined as a capacity for being affected by sensations that have no necessary link to a referent, and the human subject becomes the site and even the producer of sensation. For example, and here we have another one. Uh, and here I'm, I'm citing from a, a film by Werner Neckes, which is a wonderful treasure trove of all of these kinds of uh, toys and philosophical experiments. <clears throat> Uh, when Nekes wants to illustrate these toys, he gives us one boring example after another, but he frequently inserts, as in this case of cylinder anamorphosis, um, uh, lust examples, examples that illustrate and incite lust. <clears throat> or even when he manipulates flip books, this very simple toy that we are all familiar with. He will insert or happens to find examples that are quasi-pornographic. Knowledge of the distorting power of any medium, including the medium of the body itself, along with the knowledge of the separate workings of the different senses, gave rise to a great number of these kinds of toys and experiments which stress the ways in which the body of the observer does not so much perceive an objective reality out there as produce the illusion of that reality as sensation in here. At stake for me in this more carnal figuration of vision is an aid in understanding why and how lust is increasingly solicited by the various animations producing the illusion of movement. The stakes for Crary have more to do with the invention of modern art. To him, this invention is not a question of an ever-increasing progress towards verisimilitude, upholding a continuous ideology of representation, representing a transcendental subject. Um, and this has to do with his Foucauldianism, because he, um, because he, in a sense, observes Foucault, uh, 
That's one reason why he, he doesn't talk about viewers or spectators. He talks about observers because they are observing the discipline of that particular discourse. So as a good Fouconian, he's more interested in rupture than continuity and thus in proving that although the camera certainly did persist as a key apparatus of modernity, its model of vision entirely changed. He argues that in modernity, both the body and the eyes become a surface of inscription on which could play a promiscuous range of effects. Following his logic, I suggest that it is this very promiscuity found both in the illusion of movement created by persistence of vision over time and the illusion of depth in space created by stere stereoscopy and stereography that would bring the frenzy of the visible to a head with explicit bodies having sex in hardcore pornography. So here I suggest that visual media in the service of lust begins to make a new kind of sense, not just for libertine elites who might possess pornographic etchings or writings, but for a mass population, though certainly more for men than women, becoming exposed to ever new forms of moving and visual media. Could it be that in the midst of all this visual excitation by moving images, that in the words of Frédéric uh, Tachou, le sexe entra dans la modernité sex enters modernity. And the subtitle of his book is Photographie obscène et cinéma pornographique primitif aux origines d'une industrie. <clears throat> uh, I want to suggest, though, that perhaps this happened, sex entered modernity, not exactly in the way Tashu uh, uh, imagines as a greater realism achieved in photographic or motion picture medium, but at least partially as an effect of this new physiological optics. Query does not see modernity in general and modernist art in particular as a matter of <clears throat> lifelike verisimilitude. Rather, he argues that many non-lifelike models including cinema's famous persistence of vision, which we've already been looking at, and stereoscopy, which I'll discuss in a moment, <clears throat> flourished in this period of invention. But before investigating these, I'd like to consider the question of why pornography was not invented with the new realism of painting that followed the invention of the camera obscura. So this is a little side question. We know that graphic sexual images existed in ancient cultures, but since they were often connected to rites of fertility and since they were publicly displayed, they were not considered obscene to their own culture. Of course, they did appear so to the Victorians, who upon discovery at the excavations of Pompeii, immediately locked them up in a secret museum. Lacking perspective and, in a sense, lacking scale, uh, such images do not seem to qualify as obscene. Yet it seems to, safe to say that visual forms of pornography did not thrive during the camera obscura order uh, era uh, in the 15 through the 1800s despite the fact that there was no shortage of erotic poses in painting. Consider, for example, this early 1510, Sleeping Venus by Giorgione. This painting was remarkable for its near life-size image said to have paved the way for many future reclining nudes. Though certainly erotic, especially with the left hand placed where it is, this Venus does not seem posed to arouse lust in those who view her. Located at an early moment of Crary's period of the camera obscura model of vision, 
she alludes to sex more than she seeks to incite it. Uh, now, consider this famous woodcut by Albrecht Dürer, which has puzzled me for many, many years. It's called The Draftsman Drawing a Reclining Nude. It was published in Dürer's book in 1538, The Art of Measurement. When I look at this woodcut, I imagine an obscenity that was probably not intended. I see a reclining nude and a draftsman looking through a perspectival grid which illustrates the techniques used to draw the woman. However, I can't help but imagine the actual perspective of the draftsman, which is not pictured. If it were pictured, it might be something more like Gustave Courbet's L'Origine du Monde. For I can see no other reason for the draftsman to be looking from this perspective at the woman <coughs> uh, except to catch sight of the secret part of her anatomy that Courbet pictures, but Durer does not. The Courbet seems to invite its viewers to come close, much closer than any Renaissance painting. And you just have to go to a museum to, to see this effect. <clears throat> uh, much closer than any Renaissance painting, and it's the fundamentally scenographic space. In other words, in the Renaissance, the space is theatrical. There's a scene, and you don't come that close. Whereas with the Courbet, you are invited to come closer. And this Courbet style belongs to a newly modernist and potentially obscene era of vision. According to no less an art historian than Svetlana Alpers, the Durer woodcut celebrates Renaissance culture as a particular monocular point of view and technique for accurate and truthful representation. Alpers argues that it illustrates an active confidence in human powers illustrated in the relationship of the male artist to the female who offers her naked body to him to draw. Neither Alpers nor most other commentators see the pornographic potential of the woodcut. They see only the celebration of the technique of perspectival draw, drawing with the aid of a grid that was first described and practiced by Alberti in the previous century. Durer's woodcut is thus a kind oh, this is uh, Alberti's experiment. Durer's woodcut is thus a kind of how-to picture showing how to make paintings like Giorgione's using the tools of Alberti. The fact that I have to train myself to see that this is actually an idealized image of what the draftsman camera obscura-like apparatus can create suggests to me that I have already viewed too much pornography to see this woodcut innocently. It is clear that this illustration of the mastery of the technology of vision is not interested in exciting viewers with anything like a frenzy of the visible. Although 20th and 21st century accounts of this woodcut will begin to see the gynecological and sexual elements of the images, I should go back to the image, the gynecological and sexual elements of the images framing of man, artist as culture, woman, body as matter, and the point of the woodcut is to demonstrate the power of male subject position and technology to regulate and contain the female body, uh, not to excite either the viewer or the male artist. Nature, culture, body, mind, subject, object offer an idealized rending of monocular perspectives accomplishment. Thus, despite my own prurient imagination, pornography in the modern sense of mechanically reproduced images meant to excite an observer is only possible with anachronistic hindsight by an observer schooled in the later, more corporealized tradition. <clears throat> 
Crary's Foucauldian approach to new technologies and disciplines of the body is intent upon building an argument about modernist art. For example, he cites J.M.W. Turner's Light and Color, Goethe's theory, the morning after the deluge, to show on one hand how it can be viewed as a representation of the sun out there in the sky, but also it can be seen as a fusion of both the eye and the sun, an afterimage produced on the retina with a circular shape corresponding to both the sun and the pupil of the eye and the retinal field on which the temporal experience of an afterimage unfolds. For my purposes, Crary's theory of the demise of the camera obscura as a model of vision and the subsequent rise of a new, what he calls carnal density of vision, allows a better understanding of the link between pornography and modernity, despite the fact that Crary has nothing to say about pornography or any lower cultural form. His argument that the newly corporealized observer is subject to these modernist forms of vision, including the optical gadgets that play with the body's reactions to subjective vision, suggests that in the case of both modern art and pornography, what the eye sees is less a referent out there and more a matter of seeing, feeling the observer's own body more intensely. Since this will become modern pornography's primary goal, to arouse lust, I'd like to consider two different early routes to this effect, first in the form of stereography and second in the form of persistence of vision. To query the stereoscope best illustrates the carnally dense physiological versus the geometric model of vision. In this case, the carnal density allows the viewer to experience his or her own body through the manipulation of the body's experience of space. <clears throat> Our two-eyed binocular bodies, when viewing an object from close up, will have discrepant angles, causing us to see double. If these discrepant angles are preserved in the two separate images of a stereoscope, that is, if the object is photographed from two slightly different positions, the brain will fuse them into one, adding a sense of depth that is not really there, except as our promiscuous perception makes it so. The stereoscope was thus obscene, Crary argues, in the most literal way. I quote, it shattered the scenic relationship between the viewer and the object that was intrinsic to the fundamentally theatrical setup of the camera obscura. The stereoscope was thus not surprisingly often associated, was thus not surprisingly <laughs> often associated with pornography in the sense of seeing too much from too close of those things that were deemed obscene, that is to be kept off the scene. In fact, at stake in such images was the notion that an observer who looks at such an image seems to see it from two different places in space, requiring a frequent refocusing of the eyes as they move from plane to plane. As Jeffrey Batchen has noted, perhaps this refocusing is not a pure experience of embodiment, but rather an experience of disembodiment and then re-embodiment. For in a single act of looking, the observer is moved back and forth between two separate but conjoined embodiments. I'd like to argue that this back and forth comprises a kind of agitation and movement even though the image itself is still. The very fact that one tends to reach out one's hands as if to touch the object seen through the stereoscopic viewer attests to the uncanny ability of the medium to agitate the senses to touch that which is not really there. It is significant, I think, that Charles Baudelaire, for all his own famous decadence, 
registered shock and outrage at the sight of thousands of, I'm quoting here, in fact, I have got the quote here, thousands of greedy eyes glued to the peepholes of the stereoscope as though they were the skylights of the infinite. The love of obscenity could not let slip such a glorious satisfaction. He was shocked. <clears throat> uh, pardon me, lost my place. Um, uh, Baudelaire was positively scandalized when he saw especially a society woman, a woman of a higher class than himself, who reached for a stereoscope, saying, let me see, nothing shocks me. Clearly, the person shocked was Baudelaire himself at the sight of a woman wealthy enough and free enough to view obscenity. And it's important to know that stereoscopes were very much associated, uh, not so much with the image you see here, but much more with images like this. Uh, so, and it's certain that many of the most strenuous efforts of censorship in this era were performed to protect women from viewing them. It is even possible that this image, which I borrow from Crary, who is not talking about pornography, um, could very well indicate that thing that shocks Baudelaire. <clears throat> of course, I can't really reproduce the stereoscopic effect for us to experience, but I think you've probably seen enough um, at the movies to, um, to know what it's, what it's like. Um, the simultaneous activation and frustration of the sense of touch the very movement between these two states of almost touching and not touching um, with subjects that may, may viewers may want to touch contributes to what I'd like to think of as a frenzy of the visible even though there's no actual movement. Tactility is engaged here in a number of ways usually not mentioned in accounts of visual pleasure in the very fact that mass-produced images, whether photograph or stereograph, is accessible to handling in a way that painting is not. And here you might think of the thumb of that man who was working the flip book, that there's a, a, a kind of ability to hold up to oneself and to touch these very images. Um, and as Baudelaire might have sensed, and surely already knew from the fact that pornographic content gravitated to the stereoscope more readily than it did to photographs, there's no reason why these objects, once circulated in private spaces, could not become incitements to masturbation or other sexual acts. And that may be part of the real source of his shock. Now the other direction or strand that I want to understand here is uh, persistence of vision and the carnal density of time. Persistence of vision understood in Crary's terms is an illusion of motion, as we've already seen, created over time in the body of the observer. It is not the truth of the world out there perceived by a contemplative subject. It is the illusory effect played upon the retina of the observer in such a way that motion appears where it is not. In the hallucinatory interstices of successive still images. Unlike the spatial discrepancy of binocular vision, the temporal discrepancy of one stage of movement in time superimposed upon another creates the uncanny perception of movement when there is none. The body senses an illusion of motion. Uh, here again is another kind of and somewhat more literal frenzy of the visible. Crary discusses the philosophical toys and gadgets of this strand of experimentation, but he doesn't follow it into cinema. Film scholars think they know this history by heart. 
Uh, and here I want to introduce something that I did not know when I wrote, um, when I wrote Hardcore. Uh, by the 1850s, mass-produced photos could, as Rebecca Solnit puts it, freeze the river of time. Cinema, it is commonly agreed, became feasible with the animation or the reanimation of these frozen photos into the illusion of, mo of movement. Edward Mybridge was the inventor who melted this river into naturalistic movement and thus paved the way for uh, the invention of cinema, or so the story is usually told. To have viewed this exhibit, this is actually uh, a cover of a book about an exhibit, uh, which was called Helios Edward Mybridge in a Time of Change, uh, at the, uh, the Co Cochran and also uh, at uh, SF MoMA in San Francisco. To have seen this exhibit is to have seen how moving pictures seem to develop so naturally out of the questions one could ask still photography, like the one Leland Stanford posed to the photographer Mybridge. Do all four feet in the fast trot of a horse ever leave the ground? The shorter and shorter exposures of of what in the late 1870s and 80s was called instantaneous photography could freeze short instants of motion that the human eye could not see when in movement. The story of this vision has become a familiar legend in the annals of film history, and I've already discussed it in hardcore, but now I want to stress the greater quality of the frenzy rather than the realism of that uh, perception. Stanford had a hunch that there was a moment in the fast trot of a horse when all four feet do leave the ground. He hired Edward Mybridge in 1873 to photograph his horse, Occident, while trotting. The image was blurred, no one ever saw it, but Mybridge um, released to the press later images that uh, showed a moment in time when the horse flies. Now, it turns out that this photograph was actually retouched by a, um, by a painter um, uh, for the purpose of, as Mybridge put it, giving them a better effect, as is, as is typical with first-class photographs. Soon after, the lithographer, Courier, Courier and Ives <clears throat> produced this more mass-produced image, convincing everybody on faith, basically, <laughs> that there was a moment in the fast trot of horse that um, all four feet do leave the ground. And eventually, Mybridge was lecturing in England and the United States uh, the truth of the horse's movement. Um, now, today we might wonder why uh, lecture audiences were so willing to take such thoroughly retouched photos as the new truth of previously invisible movement. And in fact, many didn't. In Foucauldian terms, we might say that one discourse of power knowledge was developing and another, the traditional rendering of animal motion offered up by artists was being uh, discredited, and Mybridge's lectures included images of wrong horse movement. When audiences laughed at the seeming awkwardness of the newly visible motion, Mybridge invited reporters in 1878 to witness him photographing another horse, and this time he took a series of photographs, uh, developed them in front of the photographers, and soon that series was published on the cover of Scientific American, proving forever that that was the truth of horse motion. Now, Mybridge had never planned to project moving images of the photographed horse, but because some of his lecture audiences continued to disbelieve, disbelieve the authenticity of the larger-than-life projected still images, 
he conceived of an apparatus that might put back together these photographic fragments into a projected illusion of motion. The zopraxiscope was the result. In all previous examples of the projected illusion of motion, the goal was to amaze viewers that movement could be created out of something, usually a drawing, which itself did not move. Even if the motion was made out of photographs, these bodies were posed in stages of movement while move, uh, they weren't photographed while moving. At the time, Mybridge did not want to call attention to his ability to animate, that is, to bring to life that which was not alive. He only wanted to show that he had captured that tiny sliver of time, its truth. The movement that he wanted to portray already existed in nature, but just couldn't be seen. Now, the zopraxiscope has been the great mystery in the genealogy of motion pictures essentially a projecting phenakistoscope, rather like a zoetrope, Mybridge never tried to patent it. It wasn't original. What was novel was the idea of putting photographs in the place of drawings. That was what made it seem as if Mybridge had anticipated and in, sent, in a sense invented cinema. But what most scholars still do not realize is that Mybridge never did project photographs as moving images with it. In fact, if you look closely at the zopraxiscope uh, and the glass discs, uh, I guess it's not quite close enough, but um, what, what you see there are um, uh, elongated, strangely elongated drawings of horses. Um, they, are, they have been, again, touched up, um, ad adjusted. Uh, now, if one goes to the exhibit or goes to the book of this exhibit um, and walks through it, one sees that we move rather quickly from a copy of the original zopraxiscope and a wheel of drawn images to the quite detailed serial photographs of his later vast study of human locomotion, human and animal locomotion, and then to a video lo loop, here we are, to a video loop that, um, and this isn't the same video loop, but it's a typical kind of video loop that one finds animating, um, animating Mybridge's work. Uh, and th these kinds of videos have proliferated after, uh, I'm gonna go ahead a little bit. Can I read? Mm -hmm. Let's just move it ahead to the more pornographic stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's fine, we'll just, we'll just play that for a little while. <clears throat> Um, so if you experience the exhibit, an implied argument from still photos to photographic moving pictures is made um, and seemingly clinched by these kinds of animations that Mybridge could never accomplish in his own, in his own lifetime. Um, one reason scholars and textbooks skip over this kind of inconvenient truth that he could not actually do this kind of animation um, is that uh, we have firmly wanted to keep on believing in the steady trajectory towards verisimilitude of representation. So you could say, why does this matter? If the invention of pornography does not necessarily follow the invention of motion pictures as a natural progression of the realist effects of the camera obscura, then we can see in both the early exploitation of stereoscopy and this exploitation of the persistence of vision that something else is at work, something that has very little to do with the kind of sovereign power and mastery often attributed by feminists like myself to the much maligned male gaze. Indeed, Crary's reconsideration of the camera obscura model of vision may allow a feminist revision of the very causes of pornography 
and we can just stop it there, um, considered, as it often is, as the exemplar of male power and pleasure. So I don't mean to argue here that there is no masculine hegemony <clears throat> in the mid and late 19th century when scientists and showmen began to exploit the perceptual quirks of embodied vision. I think that much is obvious from Baudelaire's scandalized sight of a woman peering through a stereoscope. But I do want to argue that the frenzy of the visible that is so evident in both stereoscopy and Mybridge's experiments with motion study should not be taken as self-evident proof of the dominance of male power and pleasure. Though Crary himself seems uninterested in such lessons, I find the larger lesson of his Foucauldian-inspired work uh, to be the remarkable vulnerability of the embodied viewer or observer caught up in the perceptual agitations, motions, and quirks. Writing about these early motion studies in the late uh, 1980s, I believe the inability to treat the woman and men's bodies equally or even to clothe them similarly was an obvious fetishization that was inherently pornographic. Feminist psychoanalytic theory steered me to the conclusion that these images were products of a quite typically perverse male fantasy engaged in the disavowal of the threat of castration aroused by the sight of a naked female body. Here, Freud, more than Foucault, guided my condemnation of feminist power, uh, condemnation of patriarchal power, pleasure, and perversion. It seemed ludicrous to me that Mybridge's batteries of cameras and grids of measurement were applied to increasingly sexualized narratives spun around the bodies of women. The supposedly scientific impulse to measure and record the truth of bodily motion seemed to turn into a powerful fantasization that drives the first rudimentary narratives of moving pictures and simultaneously the origin of moving image pornography. Today I want to revise this argument from supposedly universal threats of castration towards changing discourses of modernity and sexuality. If women are especially fetishized in 19th century modernity, um, and uh, certainly they are, then to the extent that pornography becomes an extension of this perversion, I would insist less upon the scandal of the insight and more on its very predictability given many other discourses of, sexually, of sexuality combined with the social place of women at the time of hardcore pornography's emergence. If I once wanted to expose the pornography beneath the pseudoscience as if it were a bad object capable of expulsion or a hard core like a peach pit that one could simply spit out, Today, I recognize the extent to which discourses of knowledge, power, and pleasure in the growing scientia sexualis were far too entwined to ever be spit out. Moving image pornography of the period in which it entered modernity was never a prurient derailing of science, but an inescapable result of entwined discourses of sexuality and science that came to one kind of head in the still images of animal locomotion. This was a frenzy of the visible that was not yet pornography. But they came to another kind of head in the 20th century when they began to be literally animated by hordes of filmmakers. Thomas Anderson, Werner Neckes, the, the, the man I was using before to illustrate the scientific toys, and many other unan uh, 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 YouTube uh, anonymous amateurs. It is only at the point at which Mybridge is animated, which interestingly takes place, here I've got another one coming up, <laughs> which interestingly 
uh, takes place. Whoops. Um, no, I want to go to involuntary convulsions. Where is it? Oh, involuntary convulsion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that we can say that they only when they are animated, which Mybridge didn't do, can we begin to recognize features of contemporary pornography in them. Artificially induced convulsions. Okay, this one takes a little while to get, to get going. But I, I find it very interesting because to me it does anticipate the goal of hardcore pornography, which is not just to see bodies having sex, but to see bodies in the throes of involuntary convulsions. So when this image, and this is Thomas Anderson, who, and there's a voiceover, but I'm skipping it, who uh, animates this particular motion study by, by Mybridge, um, this is a kind of actual frenzy of the visible that I think pornography is on the track of, of uh, capturing. Because this is a woman who is rather like hysteria when, uh, when placed in certain positions, her body will take over and she will, um, uh, she can't help herself. Uh, and it's the involuntariness of it that, uh, that Mybridge captures, but of course he doesn't capture it, the animator later in the 1970s, and significantly it is the 1970s when pornography, hardcore pornography really is on scene that we begin to get these kinds of animations. So, animal locomotion was a vast study of human and animal motions presented as instantaneous photographs of short sequences of motion. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, I'm just gonna go over a few basic ideas about this. Um, the males in this, these studies tend to be defined by what they do, a carpenter or a mason. And the women are defined, as we already know from John Berger, by how they appear. Um, when naked man walks, he just walks. When the woman walks, my bridge tells her to do something a little extra, like put her finger or put her mouth at her, at her chin or to her mouth. If a woman runs, <clears throat> in parallel to a man running, she runs gratuitously, one could say, grasping her left breast. Um, when a man lies down, he just lies down on something like a bed. When a woman lies down, she does not do so, so much to illustrate the motion, but in a kind of fantasy scenario in which um, there's a bed and covers, which actually obscure the motion that is supposedly being, being studied. Um, the motions of a woman smoking, for example here, certainly connote uh, loose morals. A woman giving another drink to a woman from a jug just seems kind of kinky. Two women dancing, a uh, woman leaning over a chair with a kind of lustful longing, um, and then interestingly to me, the grids that are there to measure movement are not, it's absolutely still, there's no, there's no movement to be measured. Um, uh, so my idea originally was, well, that's just a pseudoscience. But my bridge scholar, Martha Brown, informs us that these seemingly scientific grids were not originally used in animal locomotion. They began to be deployed and the background for this particular unusually muscular man. Before that, there were no grids. 
Um, a well-known athlete named Ben Bailey described as a mulatto pugilist. Subsequently, they were invoked for all other motions in this vast study of animal locomotion, except, interestingly, for Mybridge's own body himself. <clears throat> um, when I, where I once saw Mybridge as the inventor of pornography and the grids of measurement as a fake scientificity, that was merely an excuse for showing naked bodies. Brown's research argues that Mybridge took the idea for the grid from the English ethnologist J.H. Lamprey, who used them in 1869 to make ethnographic photos of Malay natives. So the idea becoming automatic in comparative racial ethnography of this period was to be able to more easily measure cranial, but why not penis or breast, size through the new science of anthro anthropometry. Um, the fact that it had not previously seemed necessary to use grids for studies of other bodies and that Mybridge then invoked them throughout the rest of the study for every other body except his own, suggests that it was motivated by a desire to measure a difference from some norm. But in fact, it was not sexual difference, but racial sexual difference being measured. As an example of a more primitive masculinity, Bailey's body in movement prompted a seemingly new level of scientia sexualis for all the bodies in this study except my bridges. Was his own body the norm by which he wanted the others to be judged? We know that Mybridge, the man who murdered his wife's lover and was acquitted by an all-male jury, did have something, perhaps sexual, to prove. This is certainly an exercise of power over bodies, but if there is a male gaze at work, we need to understand that it is also a white male gaze. When Mybridge divides up the human animals in animal locomotion, he expands the scientific inquiry into the body from questions of gait, balance, speed, musculature, distribution of body weight in animals in general, to things that go unmentioned, but certainly not unnoticed in the human body, breasts, buttocks, genitals, and movement, and to which anyone raised in a culture in which nakedness is unusual cannot help but attend. Excuse me. Oh, I've gone too far. Um, <clears throat> When these organs are put into movement, which we must remember Mybridge never did, but the, these later animations do, then I think they do approach, as in the case of this woman we saw, um, something like a frenzy of the visible. So today, I don't want to say that Mybridge invented pornography in the process of inventing motion pictures, because he did neither. But, if we want to turn to photographic images with more explicit and obvious pornographic content, and here we have photographs, we can see that the presentation and display of sexual organs is much more overt. This is pornography. This is a kind of hardcore pornography. These pictures, which are taken from uh, Philippe, Philippe Soler's album photo, Licencieuse de la Belle Époque, uh, figure masturbation and simply sexual display, close up so that one can see it all. Here the content clearly intends to depict and to incite lust, and they thus fall into the category of hardcore pornography. And so I will admit that such images may be proof that Crary is not entirely right about the total demise of the camera obscura model of vision. In other words, this is verisimilitude combined with explicitness. And that has been the conventional definition of hardcore. 
But it, uh, me, it also seems self-evident that over time, as observers become used to the new physiological effects of stereoscopy and the illusion of motion in early cinema, that both become more naturalized in their effects though I think stereoscopy has retained, even in today's virtual reality, a kind of hold on the uncanny agitation of the body. However, although these poses are blatantly pornographic, I would like to suggest that they do not fully belong to a hardcore frenzy of the visible because they lack the necessary element of motion, both literally in the sense of production of motion in the observer's body as in persistence of vision and figuratively in the sense of a stereoscopy that moves from disembodiment to re-embodiment in the act of looking. Thus, even though these photos evoke movement and action, they remain still as held poses, especially here. <clears throat> Such images participate in the tradition of pornography, its drive to see more of the truth of bodily pleasure and verisimilitude is surely a factor that forms part of the tradition of pornography. But as frozen stills, they are not fully hardcore. They do not solicit their observers' bodies with the same intensity as stereoscopy or the early uncanny experience of persistence of vision in producing motion. So while there is no question that such photographs contribute to an intensified field of the visible and an ongoing quest to make the secrets of sex more and more visible, I would still insist that the full-fledged frenzy of the visible occurs when pornographic bodies move and when that movement is highlight highlighted as such. And then I finally can turn to a, a, an actual pornographic early film, which will take just a second to get to. <clears throat> um, what's going on here is a man who seems to be either a waiter or a servant uh, bursts into a room to show his uh, dirty postcards to the women. Dirty, dirty postcards were a a convention of photography. Um, what's different here is that these, po these postcards will come alive. And it's that uncanny coming alive from still pose to movement that I think is, is being highlighted here in this uh, uh, 2003 uh, early French pornographic film. Notice you see his hand holding it. Notice that the, uh, the sex act is neither begun nor ended. It's just sort of in medias res. Race. <clears throat> and the fascination is the movement. So he shows the first one woman, scandalizes her, However, they're ready to look at more. So now with the second woman, we get a little bit more of a beginning. And quite typical, uh, he's going to show them one more. And the whole question, of course, is in, in early pornographic films is how do they end? And usually they, they do not end the way the pornography we're used to today ends. They, they, um, they come to kind of abrupt conclusions. They don't end with exterior ejaculation so that you can see the convulsions, the automatic involuntary convulsions of the body. 
What I think audiences are fascinated by in this is the fact that he is holding it, that it is a card, an erotic postcard that has come to life and that it's the movement is the fascination and the, the, the pornographic content is a kind of uh, bringing to fruition of that movement. And this is a brief period probably in which, in which pornography is still uncanny. And, and then as all films, you know, Lumiere's Gardner, Watered, how do you end? You end with uh, the punishment of the, of the male who has brought in the dirty. So I think the film illustrates not only sexual agitation in its content, but also the presumed sexual agitation of those who view it, since the viewers of the carte erotique who see themselves in the film. In other words, the women who are watching the carte erotique become the performers in the, in the film. Uh, this coming to life would not necessarily have been taken for granted yet as we do uh, moving images. Rather, as with Mybridge's animation of horses, such lifelike motions of humans and sex were not yet familiar as movements to see. Thus, the uncanny coming to life of this particular kind of movement would probably have produced a contradictory reaction as both verisimilitudinous and, at least at first, as bizarre and strange. Both the horse and the human movements took some getting used to. So if Crary is not absolutely correct about the carnal density of vision of physiological optics in modernity, if camera obscura verisimilitude is still to some degree at play in the early invention of hardcore pornography as photography, he kind of skips over photography altogether in his book, um, we do well to appreciate that part of the stimulation of such moving images must have been the strangeness of their movement. It's also important to note that unlike the parlor, cafe, or place of work where erotic or scandalous still photos or even stereographs would have been seen, a film like this would have been shown in a special venue, most likely a maison close in Europe or South America or a men's only stag party in the US. The venue itself suggests the expectation of arousal, a greater frenzy of the visible. In this agitation then, I think we discover hardcore pornography. So, to conclude, I just think I was naive to be offended by the lack of equality of movement and gesture accorded women's bodies in Mybridge's motion studies. Why should I have expected the late 19th century to te te treat women equally? I was also naive to think that Mybridge himself invented pornography as a form of disavowal at the sight of naked women. That was simply a residue of my psychoanalytic inspired feminism that wanted to condemn the supposed sovereignty and mastery of male vision <clears throat> and its need to control through voyeurism and fetishism. So if I've learned one thing in studying pornography, it is not that the enemy is pornography or the frenzy of the visible. In latching on to that term, I was, I think, inchoately condemning the visible itself, while also condemning the pornographers and the proto-pornographers. Today, I think that a feminist perspective on lust, motion, and emotion, and the frenzy of the visible needs to critique the patriarchal power without assuming that a masteral sovereign male gaze has been in continuous force since the invention of perspective. Crary's reconsideration of the camera obscura model of vision may allow us to see better how deeply intertwined are knowledge, power, and pleasure in the field of the, vis of the visual. It would take both an ongoing sexual revolution and the ongoing struggles of feminism for pornography to begin to address itself to women's own greedy eyes. Thank you. <laughs>